say, hey, this is Linda from the Iron Maiden, and you're listening to the Australian Rock Show. We're going to be in town in a couple months, so we hope to see you soon. Hey, 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 it's Dennis Gray, and it is show number 91 of the Australian Rock Show. If you're a long-time listener, welcome back. And if this is your first time tuning in, we really appreciate your time in checking us out. Since forming back in 2001, the Iron Maidens have become one of the most popular and in-demand tribute bands of all time. In May and June, the highly acclaimed World's Only Female Tribute to Iron Maiden remove all the wheel blocks, gather speed and get airborne, hitting Australian stages for the first time. Powerhouse drummer Linda McDonald previously did time in the amazing Los Angeles outfit Phantom Blue, a band who've long been on our rock and roll radar. We got Linda on the phone a couple of days back and had a detailed and lengthy chat, looking over her early days, her influences, Iron Maiden, Phantom Blue, the upcoming Australian tour, and much, much more. We'll get to that interview in a moment. You know it, straight after a song to get you all fired up. Crank this sucker up good and loud, folks. Lifted from 1993's Built to Perform album, a record which sits permanently in my all-time top ten. Here are the mighty fan and blue with Better Off Dead. Hello. Hey, Linda, it's uh, Dennis from the Australian Rock Show. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you? Not too bad. Um, now, you wouldn't have heard it just now, but we kicked off this show with the Phantom Blue track, Better Off Dead, from the wonderful Built to Perform record. And I know you get a songwriting credit on that tune. Can you cast your mind 20-something years back and tell me how that one came about? Oh, my gosh. Yep. Um, gosh, has it really been that long ago? I guess it has. <laughs> um, that song, oh, that was a fun one. Um, that song was written about somebody that was supposedly helping us out at the time and we were not happy with them Mm. whatsoever. So we thought that he deserved a song. (laughs) And there you go. We kind of said it like we meant it, but, um, yeah, it was a good one. It was a good fun one. Well, we will get (laughs) to the I don't think knows on him, so I'm mention it because <laughs> he's still around. <laughs> <laughs> we will get to the Iron Maidens, but I should come straight out and confess that I absolutely loved Phantom Blue. I own the albums on vinyl. I even still have my comic book. How's that? Oh my God. Wow. That is so awesome. That's so may awesome. I, Thank you. May I say the Built to Perform is on my all time top 10 list, and I think it's close to the perfect rock record. How do you look back on that album? Wow. That's uh, quite an honor. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're really, I know all of us are really proud of that. Um, and we have Max Norman to thank for so much of that. <laughs> I mean, back, that was back in the day when uh, record companies and producers actually took time to put you through pre-production and work with you on things and, and clean things up and make it just so ready to go in the studio and and bang it out, you know. And I got to back up to Don Dawkin too. We have to thank him because he took us under his wing um, and basically supported the band for months, um, helping us out and getting us prepped for a big showcase that he set up at the Roxy Theater and invited all the big wigs and all the major labels down and created a uh, bidding war. <laughs> Pretty much, he knew what he was doing, and with that, we ended up. Um, with a battle between Hollywood Records and Geffen Records, and Geffen Records won out. And from there, we we scored because we got to work with Max Norman. And there you go. In a in a, a long nutshell, that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Max Norman's production is superb, and your explosive drum sound and double yeah. kick. I believe, are key ingredients in what makes that album so great. Iconic artwork as well, by the way. Just love that. So how close was, because uh, I remember at the time there was there was talk of Don Dockin producing Built to Perform, was there not? Okay. Uh, Don Dockin produced, um, he was up in the studio and we did a lot of uh, demo recording with him and Wing Davis. Mm. Um, so he really helped us polish off the song so that when we got to the point of going in and recording with Max Norman, um, 
it was just minor changes of, you know, tweaking. Let's have the bass and the drums lock in a little better here, not so busy here, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay, so besides Max Norman, from memory, Steve Fontano did the first record. Bob Kulik has produced some of the Iron Maiden stuff. How important is it to get the right person in the producer's chair? You know, it's so important. It's absolutely important. <laughs> um, going in with Bob Kulik, it was a little bit different because it's not armature. Um, so it, there, there wasn't that kind of pre-production work. But, you know, he's, he's behind the, the wheel here, and he's uh, helping keep creating and getting the overall sound for the finished product. And you definitely have to be comfortable working with the person that you're in. You can't have somebody in there that's going to be creating any kind of tension or, you know. Um, he knows some shit. I mean, mm. he knows guitar sounds. He knows, he knows what he's doing. So and he's, he's a pleasure to work with. He's a very strict vegan, I believe, and you know you learn a lot about that stuff too. His nutrition mm. is great, and he's in great shape, and he's a character. He's a character. <laughs> so let's drift back a, a little yeah. while. So you, you were born in Montana, and I read that you were a self-taught drummer, but at one stage attended the Dick Grove School of Music in LA. What did you gain from that experience? Oh gosh, um, I had to schlep my drum set there every day. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of road schlepping. <laughs> no, um, seriously, at the Dick Grove School of Music, I took some theory classes um, in addition to uh, just drum set styles classes um, because drums wasn't my first instrument. So I did have experience with playing some piano and this and that. But when I was writing material with people, I wanted to be able to communicate more to them with what I was hearing instead of just saying um, something like this and, you know, mock out some rhythm or, or be able to tell them what type of mood or mm. just to be able to speak their, their language. And I think that's an important thing for musicians to do. Um, it's always a good thing to learn to play more than one instrument mm -hmm. um, on many levels. But, um, and also the drum set style, um, it was an amazing class because everybody brought their own kit in there was about 10 of us, and we all just played. It was so inspiring. It was so amazing. It was a lot of fun. Mm. Um, and was it before that or after that? Before that, I, I had attended um, the Musicians Institute uh, just for the summer session. And just being around so many people, I have a very competitive side. Um, it just really pushes you to be as good as and try to be better than you know your peers you know you want to keep up with everybody and I thought it was a very healthy thing everybody was there to help everybody else and this is uh before the Musicians Institute expanded um into what it is now uh, so it was a very small school and they only did vocals drums guitar and bass and it was it was just so full of talent as it is now, but it's, it's totally different now. So was there a mentor? Um, who, who would you say had the biggest impact on your drumming career early on? Um, you know, I hate for it to sound cliche because I'm in an Iron Maiden tribute band, but um, actually Clive Burr is one of the main reasons that I really went, I crossed the line from enjoying drums, thinking about getting drums, wanting to learn to play drums, to actually getting off my butt and seeking out drums and getting drums because the energy that I heard him producing on that Made in Japan album, I knew it was live takes, and it was just an energy that spoke to me, I guess. Mm. And I wanted to learn how to be a drummer and create that kind of energy too. Um, but, of course, along the way... Uh, John Bonham in the early days was a big influence. Um, the big fat beat that just, I don't even need to go into why mm, John Bonham mm. is so great. <laughs> um, I loved Alex Van Halen playing because um, of all the, the intricate little ride things he did that behind Van Halen that sounded, it sounds like he's just keeping simple time in the stuff you heard on the radio. 
but he's actually doing so much more. He's, I think, one of the most underrated uh, rock drummers out there. If you don't dig really deep, you don't hear how brilliant he actually is. So the the story goes that I've read online that uh, it was your brother's copy of the Made in Japan EP, which got you into, well, as you just mentioned, on, on the road into to rock and roll and in music. He must have been pretty clued on to, I guess, to what was cool back then, because it wasn't a, that that album or that EP didn't really hit the, the mainstream uh, charts, did it? It didn't. Um, my brother had impeccable taste in music. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um and you know, like you probably read, I, I I wasn't a I wasn't well behaved one day at school and got caught. So hmm. I went home, and for a few days I wasn't allowed back. And um, I dug into his record collections, and I found that. I mean, uh, it was amazing. That was it. <laughs> so, I'm guessing you saw Maiden in the '80s, Long Beach, maybe. I did. I did. I saw uh, Clive Burr's last tour. So I did make it there with my brother and um, a girl school and the Scorpions were also on the bill. And we were walking to get to our seats and girl school was playing and they were playing, I remember, Tush. And I had not even actually sat down behind a drum set yet at this point. But I just, I was so jealous. <laughs> there, there was this old girl band on the stage that my all-time favorite band was going to be playing on. Oh, my God. And I just thought, I could do that. I know I could. I could do that, too. And that is what really, what, uh, that was another really big push to make me get off my butt and go and get a damn kit. And within the next couple of weeks, I did. So that was awesome. Okay, so um, let's. I'm going to make you think again. So on Phantom Blue's self-titled album, you wrote no songs. Yet on Built to Perform, you co-wrote um, five tunes. Had your confidence grown as a songwriter in between albums? Well, um, I think really the difference between the first and second one, I think we as a band started to collaborate a little bit more. Um, mm. the, first, the first album, I think the, the guitar players really had a whole bunch of ideas already for the most part and brought those all to the table as the band was forming. And um, during pre-production, uh, some other ideas were brought into the mix. Um, and I think that's how the writing kind of got co-writing in the first album. The second album, um, definitely all of us expanded a little bit more with our ideas um, and contributed and listened to riffs that each of us were doing or even drum things and um, just collaborated better together overall. So I guess we grew as a band. And so I guess, yes, we all got a little more confident. <laughs> now, I know that uh, you've toured Europe a bunch of times now, but that first seven-week tour of Europe back in 89 with Phantom Blue must hold fond memories for you. Oh, my God. That was... So exciting. It was one of the most exciting and rewarding moments I can remember. <laughs> um, it was a dream come true. I mean, we were all so young, and that's, you know, that's what you do it for. You do it, the music thing because you, you want to play and you want to write songs and um, you want to go and see the world and tour the world and get a record deal and. We did that, and we were so excited. It was just so exciting because all of us hadn't ever been to Europe before either, so it was just a whole new world, so to speak. Mm. Now, I actually, uh, I actually saw you guys in London back in 1994 in support of Built to Perform at the Camden Underworld and also the Shepherd's Bush Empire. Uh, from memory, uh -huh. I attended an in-store at Croydon as well. How's my memory? Do you recall those dates? Uh, I do. <laughs> I do. Um, we were, I, there's some pictures and stuff circulating on the internet from that meet and greet. I remember we were on our way to the meet and greet and they had us in a cab and we got out of the cab and this woman stopped us and she, she started freaking out and she asked if she could take our pictures and said her husband was going to be so jealous that he wasn't there and this was so new to us. We thought she had to be joking, right? <laughs> 
It was amazing. And then we were escorted down um, to the record shop and did the meet and greet. And we were just so amazed that there were actually people there to meet us and see us and <laughs> buy our records. <laughs> We obviously don't have enough time to go through the full uh, history. I know that Phantom Blue soldiered on for a while into the late, late 90s with other band members. At what stage do you think you realised it was over for the band? Um, you know, there was a point that it was like beating a dead horse. And, and you know, the band used to be really, really great. Um, as time progressed, um, it was just really hard finding the right members who shared mm. that same enthusiasm and interest um, and wanted to carry the same amount of weight and responsibility. And I don't know, it just said it started to not be fun anymore. And then with the whole change of, you know, the grunge scene coming in, mm, mm. Um, it, it just wasn't a very good time period. And I, it was definitely time to just hang it up. You know, I interviewed um, Gigi, Gigi Hangar some time back, and I'm going to ask you the same question I did her, which is looking mm-hmm. back and with hindsight, would you have done anything different uh, with Phantom Blue? I know that she said signing with Hollywood Records, maybe. Um, no. It ran the course and path that it was meant to. Mm. Um, and, I, you know, Geffen was the great label, you know. <laughs> I think everything happens for a reason. And sure. I don't know what would have happened had we signed with Hollywood Records. Um, you never know, because Geffen's problem was they didn't know how to market this type of music um, mm-hmm. with an all-girl band, supposedly. But I don't know how um, Hollywood, Record, uh, Hollywood Records would do with that either, because they were a brand new label. Um, it's... It's a mystery. <laughs> but I'm so, glad we get the Fan and Blue seem to have good chemistry between band members. Uh, that's what I noted when I saw you live. And I imagine that's a key component with any successful band, isn't it? And something you have in the Iron Maidens too. I think so. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it becomes a family. And sometimes mm. you spend more time with bandmates than you do with your own family. Sure. Um, especially going on the road. You know, you don't have to be best friends with everybody because that would... That would kind of be weird, I guess. But you have to be civil. You have to respect each other. And, you know, I think all of us genuinely like each other. um, Because you have to work together. May 21st, 2018 marks 10 years since Michelle Meldrum passed away. Is there a memorial show or anything planned? Um, We only did a benefit show when she had passed that year Mm. that she passed. Mm. Um, uh, all the rest of the band members are in touch, but, um, I mean, God, I wish that we could. I know, I wish we could, but I just, it doesn't seem like something that's going to happen. Well, she uh, tragically passed away too young, and I guess her memory, though, will always live on via the fan and Blue material, won't it? Absolutely, and you know what, when she passed, that was also the biggest influence on the decision to stop, because... Mm. She was a huge part of that band, and she just wasn't around anymore. I mean, we were gonna, we were talking about uh, reuniting and going and doing some East Coast and doing some tour dates uh, with the original members, but um, that didn't happen. Unfortunately, sure. she passed, and that was that's, it's very sad. I guess well, the Iron Maidens have been at it for over fifteen years now. Are you surprised at how successful the band have become? I mean, not all tribute bands. Um, I guess are as competent, enduring, and as well received as you guys. We are shocked as shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a tribute band for Christ's sake, sure. but we are so thrilled that. I mean, sixteen years ago, I would have never, I would have never have guessed that this would have still been going, mm. and stronger than ever. So we are all on our knees, grateful that we can keep doing this because it is so much fun. And there are just so many Maiden fans all around the world. It's crazy. But, I mean, it's, it's just amazing. And they just, they welcome us to come and play the music for them. And we are so grateful for that. I know that you have strong fan bases in, um, I guess, South America and Japan. And I note that, as a side note, Keiko Tarada from the legendary Japanese outfit Shoya did some liner notes on 
your um, the Iron Maiden's Route 666 album. Are you familiar with Shoya and the Japanese rock scene? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know those girls. <laughs> mm, mm. You know, my, your friend, my best friend in the whole world, Ginger Suzuki, who uh, now lives in Japan, but she yeah. worked with all these Japanese bands and she brought them over um, to the U.S. and um, translated, uh, worked for magazines and all that stuff. So um, she introduced me to them and when they were out here playing and I went and I saw them and they're amazing. They're just absolutely amazing. Great players and yeah. um, great show and just sweet as can be. Sweet as can be. I know it's <laughs> been some time since the band released Recorded Product. Any plans to release another EP? Absolutely. We are actually going um, into the studio to record in, when is that? In August. Is it all, um, tell me about it. Uh, we're going to go in and record another tribute CD uh, mm -hmm. in August um, because we already released a few, but they're all out of print. We don't have any more. They don't exist. And people keep asking for them and the, the CDs that we did record, obviously they don't have any of the new, new members and, mm. and by new members, I mean the newest member now is, is already in five years. So <laughs> mm -hmm. they've been happy with what is up on YouTube so far, but um, every time we play, people keep saying, we want a CD, we want a CD. So I guess we're going to go on ahead and do that again then. And uh, give them what they want. Former Iron Maiden's guitarist Nita Strauss has picked up many accolades since leaving the band. As recently as, uh, I guess, a couple of months back, Ibanez Guitars released her signature model. Were you aware when you first heard her play that uh, I guess she was something special? Absolutely. Um, Courtney brought her in, and she just she has that special aura about it. She's got this vibe, this energy of fun and... You know, she she knows how to command the stage, and she plays great. So yeah, she's definitely star quality. <laughs> What's and the? There she goes. <laughs> she <laughs> is taking off. She is like on fire right now. We are all so proud of her. What's the most challenging Maiden song to play live? Mm, well, <sighs> you know what? To sit down and just play. Gosh, let me think. <laughs> You know, I, I would say power slave for me because sometimes my foot just gets a little tired if I'm tired. Um, <laughs> sure. I mean, I can feed it and it'll be okay, but I like to try to do it exactly as it's done on the CD. Um, but if you're talking about in context of a live set, um, Run to the Hills is not difficult to play, but when it's at the end of almost two hours set on the third night, it's the hardest song to play in the world. <laughs> mm hmm Nearly out of time, and I will mention the Iron Maidens Australian and New Zealand gig dates for May and June at the end of this show. Will you ever return to performing in an original outfit, or is being in a much-loved tribute band too much fun, and I guess also more lucrative? You know what? With an original band... Okay, wait. With a tribute band, you have to spend so much time and put yourself into it that it has to be something you love. The same mm. goes for original, but... I think even more so if um, it's the right right formula, if it's the right music, I'm mm -hmm. there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you got to check out um, two of the girls in the band, um, Nikki and Courtney. They're both uh, writing some original stuff and um, doing stuff solo. So Nikki's got some stuff out. She releases a, a song every month or so or, you know, um, where she's singing and doing guitars. And Courtney is working on something a uh, solo cd that will be out probably later this year and they both mm. have their signature guitar models out and they're they're just kicking ass <laughs> linda <laughs> thanks for your time today every guest on our show gets to choose a song by an australian band what would you like to choose and why well yeah, i guess the obvious one to say would be acdc right <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um so i'm gonna say acdc and I'm going to say Problem Child because an ode to Michelle Meldrum. We used to play that song with Phantom Blue and we had a blast playing it live. So a bit Fantastic. of Michelle Meldrum, a bit of Phantom Blue, ACDC and Australia. There you go. 
Fantastic. Look forward to catching up with you when you guys tour Australia soon. Thanks for your time today. Definitely. Good, good catching up with you. For Linda McDonald, that was, of course, ACDC circa 1976 with Problem Child. I sure hope you all enjoyed that interview with Linda. I have been a massive fan of Phantom Blue since the late 1980s, and it was a pleasure to have her on the show today. Linda and the Iron Maidens are jetting down under in May and June, so make a note of these dates and do not miss out. Friday, May 25th, the tour kicks off in Auckland in New Zealand at the studio. Saturday, May 26th, they're on at the Foundry in Christchurch. Next night, Sunday, May 27th, at the San Fran in Wellington. 30th of May, the Iron Maidens play the Zoo in Brisbane. They hit Sydney Thursday, May 31st, at the Manning Bar down there in Camperdown. Friday, 1st of June, they're on at the Corner Hotel in Melbourne. That'll be a big one. Saturday, June 2nd, Fowler's live in Adelaide before finishing the tour in Perth on Sunday, June the 3rd, at the Badlands Bar. Head to OzTix to nab your ticket. Also check them out online at theironmaidens.com. Tons of band info, merch and tour dates, etc. on there as well. Folks, it is time to get out of here. Australianrockshow.com, that's our online home and that's the place to access all the past episodes and to learn more about us and Australia's loudest and proudest rock and roll podcast. Contact us via email, australianrockshow at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, hear us at places like iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn and Mixcloud, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks once again for tuning in, folks. We'll see you on the next show, which will not be too far away. Hallowed Be Thy Name from Iron Maiden's 1982 record, The Number of the Beast, has long been acclaimed as one of the greatest heavy metal songs of all time. Back in 2005, with their original vocalist, RJ Kim, the Iron Maidens did a blazing take of that track, and that's the one we're going to close out today's show with. And you all know the drill by now. If you're listening in whilst driving, turn that volume up and roll the window down so you can educate others. Lifted from their aforementioned tribute album cut back in 2005, here are the Iron Maidens tearing through the Maiden classic, Hallowed Be Thy Name. Until next time, this is Dennis. Out.